Uh, my name is Fanula O'Neill, and I'll be giving you this um, presentation today on um, meadow grasses and bent grasses. So, uh, just to give you, um, a, a, just to first of all thank the project supporter, which this year is National Parks and Wildlife Service of the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage. So it's great. Um, this Irish Grasslands project is, of course, an initiative of the BSBI. So it's, it's great to have their support again this year. But today's webinar, um, I'm, I'm going to cover just to do a quick recap on the structure of grasses so that we all are singing from the same hymn sheet when we're talking about the different parts of the plant. And I'll start with meadow grasses then, um, looking at the characteristics of the genus. To look at the main species found in Ireland and Britain and how you distinguish them from each other. And then with bent grasses, exactly the same characteristics of the genus, what are the main species and how to distinguish them. So the structure of a typical grass plant, if there is such a thing, and you know most of them share the same characteristics, you have the non-flowering shoot, which is often referred to in texts as the tiller, and this consists of the roots, the stem and the leaves. So essentially this part of the plant, the roots, the stem and the leaves of the plant and the leaves attach to the stem at a, a bulge called the node. And then the flowering shoot, which is often called the culm, is uh, <clears throat> it includes the flowering head or the inflorescence, which arises from the top of the shoot. Now the grass leaf, which is probably one of the main parts that we would use for ID purposes, consists of two main parts. So you've got your leaf blade, which in texts will often be called the lamina. And we have the lower part of the sheath, which is, if you like, wrapped around the stem, and that's called a sheath. Um, and here at the junction between the leaf blade and the sheath, you've got a few other things going on. Um, which again can help with identification and I'll um, explain those just a little bit uh, further on. So sometimes um, a key will ask you does the leaf taper gradually or is it parallel sided and usually you can tell by looking at it for example this one here it's very obvious that it's tapering but if you're not sure then just fold the leaf over in half to see if the upper third of the leaf is the same width as the lower third. And that'll tell you then if, if the leaf is tapering gradually or if it's parallel for most of the sides, uh, for most of the way, and then narrowing um, quite suddenly to the tip. So the ligules and the oracles then, what, what are these? So just to recap, as I say, your, your leaf blade and your sheath um, joined together um, at um, the junction between the leaf blade and the sheath, you have often um, a flap of tissue called a ligule. And this can be um, either membranous or it may consist of a rim of hairs. Um, now, not in the species we're looking at today, um, but your ligule can also be very long and pointed like this, or it may be quite short and truncate like this one here. Um, also, you have what are called oracles, uh, which are um, little outgrowths or ear-like projections from the side of the, uh, from the base of the leaf. And this um, can be diagnostic as well. Now, as it happens, neither Poa nor Agrostis have, um, have oracles, so it is not something you're going to use in IDing these species, but certainly if you see any oracles, then you know it's not a poa and it's not an agrostis. So that in itself is useful. Um, sometimes on the sheath as well, you can see um, little hairs maybe present on parts of the sheath. And this will come into one of the species of poa. So ligules, just this is quite an important point for you to, to make for you to, um, for you to be aware of when you're looking at ligules on plants. Ligules on flowering shoots are usually longer than those on vegetative shoots. So if you're using a key, then you really need to know what type of shoot your key is referring to. So for example, if you're using a vegetative key, which is only looking at the vegetative parts of the plant, 
and not at the flowering, uh, the flowering head, then you only look at ligules on non-flowering shoots. If you're using a key to flowering grasses, then you should check maybe the second or third ligule from the top of the flowering shoot, because sometimes the, the one at the top can maybe be a little bit um, different in character to, to the ones further down. So if you take nothing else from this webinar, I think um, just take note of this point. Ligules can vary depending on whether it's a vegetative shoot or whether it's a flowering shoot. So just, you know, be, be mindful of that. And if at all possible, use the freshest material that you can as well. So rather than, you know, getting a ratty piece of sort of dead or dying grass, um, just have a hunt around and see if you can find a nice fresh piece with all the ligules and everything um, intact and all the, the characteristics of the, of the grass as they should be. So in terms of vegetative spread, grasses have a number of different uh, methods, if you like. Um, they may spread by ab above ground horizontal stems called stolons. Um, and from once the stolons um, touch the ground at the node, then their adventitious roots um, will be produced and a shoot can arise from that, or indeed a number of shoots. There are also below ground horizontal stems, which are under the soil, um, which can often be scaly. They're, they're not going to be green. If, if you see any green parts on one of these structures, then you're talking about a stolon because it's above ground. So underground horizontal rhizomes and very short rhizomes then can give rise to tufted plants. And long rhizomes give rise to large patches of grass. So, for example, the likes of you know, Hulcus mollus or you know, um, any of the Hulcuses, they will tend to have uh, a much more mat forming sort of growth. So here, for example, on the top uh, left, we have an example of creeping habit, which is this is actually a grass of Stolonifera. So you have you can see your stolons there creeping out from the edge. And this would be common in, in lawns like my own, maybe, which isn't particularly well managed. Um, and it's spreading out from its, um, it's spreading out across the concrete via stolons. And then this other habit here is tufted habit. Now, this is neither Poa nor Agrostis. This is actually Yorkshire fog, but it very nicely illustrates the tufted habit, um, which is just lots of individual shoots arising from the same point. Here again are stolons and across to stolonifera, um, just photographed this week in uh, Roscommon. So you can see some colonizing agrostis here with your stolons creeping out from the main plant. And uh, this one here in particular, nice and long and just spreading across the nice bare um, peaty ground here. So in terms of the reproductive um, part of the, of the grass, so the flower head, uh, I know this is quite a busy slide. I do have um, diagrams to um, just to illustrate these points. But just to run through it, the inflorescence in Poa and Agrostis, the flowering head is what's called a loose panicle, um, which bears many uh, spikelets. And each spikelet then is held on a little stalk called a pedicel. And it consists of a number of parts. So first of all, you've got the lower and the upper glooms, which protect the developing spikelet. And within those glooms, then you have one or many florets. And a floret just consists of the flower and two individual bracts. And these bracts are the lemma, which is the larger outer one, and the palea, which is the inner smaller one. And the flower itself, of the grass consists as a normal flower does of your female um, pistil, your male stamens. And in the case of grasses, you have two little scales called lodicules, which are probably the, the remnants of sepals and petals. So just to, um, to give this the pictorial um, run through. So this is again, um, 
The panicle here is Halkus lanatus uh, because it's quite a good one to illustrate nice uh, chunky head. So you've got your spikelets, individual spikelets here held on um, an inflorescence. You have the kind of central spike or central stem of the inflorescence, which is the ratchet. And then the spikelet is attached to the ratchet via a little tiny stalk, which you can barely see there. And then the spikelet itself, you have your lower gloom here, which is the outer one. You've got your upper gloom, which is the inner one. And then these two glooms enclose all the spikelets. Okay, so each of these individual spikelets here. This is quite a, a nice um, illustration here of, um, this is Bromus hardiaceus. So you can see the spikelets here are uh, very definite and very obvious. So this is one spikelet. These are the glooms down here. And within each of those, you've got your florets. So again, just in diagrammatic form, you've got your two glooms at the bottom. You've got your florets. These are your florets here. Sorry, I was referring to them incorrectly earlier on, but uh, you'll forgive me for that. Um, so these are your little florets. Within your floret, you have your lemma, which is the outer bract, and you've got your palea, which is the inner bract. Now it's important um, to know the difference between um, your various different bracts here, because your lemma, which is, um, as I say, the one that is within the, the floret, this is your lemma here. This is useful in um, IDing plants, in IDing grass plants, whereas the palea is not really used that much in ID at all. So you're mainly looking at your two blooms, which is the bottom of the spikelet, and you're looking at your lemma, which is the, the bract, the bigger bract in the little florets here. Hopefully that's clear enough. And just to recap on the spikelet structure, so you have one or more florets in a spikelet. Your spikelet is surrounded by two leaf-like glooms. And in this particular example here, you have two florets. So here you have your lemma, your palea, your floral, um, these are your male parts. Here again, another floret, your lemma, your palea. And within that, we can't see them, are the, the anthers and the pistil of the grass flower. And your upper and your lower gloom. Okay, so that's your spikelet structure. So useful to remember this because when you're referred to a key, then these are the characters that you'll be having to, to think of. So things to check in your spikelet then, how many florets are there? So for Agrostis, um, there's only one floret per spikelet. In Poa, there are two or more. With the glooms, which are the two brats at the base of the spikelet, are they the same size? Are they sub-equal? So sort of almost the same size, but maybe not quite. Or are they completely different sizes, one much bigger than the other? How many veins are in each of the glooms? and how many veins on the lemma. Is there an awn, which is the bristle uh, that you find on some grasses? Um, if there is an awn, is it on the gloom or on the lemma? Does it arise from the tip or from down the back of the, the lemma? And is it straight or is it bent? So that's your quick recap of grass structure. A um, bit of a whistle stop tour, but um, at least it'll just get you in the frame of mind to look at when we're looking at the, um, the plants from here on in. So I'm going to start off with uh, meadow grasses. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Poa trivialis, which has gone over, and a lot of the um, Poa flowering heads, well, they're practically all gone over at the moment. Um, and when they do, uh, start to sort of die back. They do tend to have this quite droopy appearance. So a little bit, you know, sad looking. Um, po trivialis, this one here, it is, it's quite drooping, but some of the other ones are even more sad and, you know, unhappy looking. It was lashing rain yesterday when I took this photo. So that, that probably didn't help. <laughs> so the vegetative characteristics of poa species, 
um, the leaf tip is boat shaped or text will refer to it as hooded or keeled. Um, in other words, it's quite three dimensional and you can actually feel it as you run your finger along the leaf. As you get to the tip, you can feel that it's, you can actually feel the, the three dimensional structure of it. So you can't actually flatten the leaf all the way to the tip without splitting it. So this is your boat shaped tip. The shoot base and the stems are at least slightly flattened and often enough they're actually noticeably flattened. The young leaves are folded in the shoot, they're not rolled. And the, the sheets and the leaves are usually hairless. But um, for poor humanists, we'll see later on, sometimes there can be leaf, um, there can be hairs on the sheet or at the base of the, of the leaf blade. Another good characteristic of poa species is um, these two tram lines. So there are two grooves running either side of the midrib on the upper leaf surface. And the best way to see these is you can either hold your leaf up to the light and look at it with your hand lens. Um, so you should see um, these two sort of parallel grooves running either side of the midrib and they're visible as a sort of a pale line on either side. Um, the other thing you can do to view it is to sort of curl the leaf over your finger and again look at it with your hand lens and you should see two little grooves on either side of the midrib and that is a pretty good way of seeing these tram lines as well and they can help to distinguish poa from other species or other genera. The other thing is there aren't any cross veins on the leaves or the sheets of poa. And I'll mention this later on just in relation to Glyceria, uh, which can sometimes look, um, it can, poa trivialis and Glyceria fluitans can sometimes look very similar. So I'm just gonna mention that again later on. And most of the poas that we have, uh, certainly in Ireland and Britain, are perennial. And we just have one annual species, really, which is Poa annua. In terms of the floral characteristics, there's not necessarily a whole lot you can um, hang your hat on, really. The inflorescence is always a panicle, which is good to know. And the spikelets contain two or more flowers. So quite often the, the spikelets are reasonably chunky looking. And this is a list of the poa species found in Ireland as recorded in the National Biodiversity Data Centre um, database. So it, it at least gives um, an idea of the relative uh, occurrence or frequency of occurrence of each of the species. So the most common um, poa species that we have um, in Ireland, and this pretty much goes for Britain as well, is poa annua followed by poa trivialis and poa pretensis and down to poa humilis. So those four are the, the four main ones. So annual meadow grass, rough meadow grass, smooth meadow grass and spreading meadow grass. Poa nemoralis is, is not really, I suppose, within the, the remit of this project in a way, because it's not really a grasslands uh, species, but um, it does occur with reasonable frequency, um, certainly in Britain, much more common in Britain than in Ireland. Um, it's a little bit more scattered here, here in Ireland. So I just wanted to show you the BSBI distribution maps of each of these species. And this gives a very good um, representation of the, the distribution. Um, so Poa annua, pretty much everywhere in Ireland and Britain. Poa trivialis, also pretty much everywhere, a few small gaps. With nothing much to write home about. Poa pretensis, this is um, in the, the strict um, sense of stricto, uh, is again very common but um, a little bit more scattered in Scotland and in parts of Ireland, especially around the Midlands. And then Poa humilis is a bit, again a bit more scattered in Ireland um, than in Britain and the Midlands of Britain as well, not maybe quite so, um, um, so well distributed there either. And after that, things tend to drop off 
Here's a Poe and Nemoralis, which is really, it's quite astonishing, really, the, the difference in distribution between Britain and Ireland here. It is introduced in Ireland, um, so that's probably part of the reason why it's much less common here. And then after that, things really do drop off. Poa compressa, again, much more common in Britain. Poa palustris, Poa chaxii, Poa alpina, really mostly in the kind of highlands of Scotland. Poa inferma, which is a more southeast, um, southern Britain species. Poa bulbosa. And these, there are a couple of other species, but I just listed the ones that are found both in Britain and Ireland. Um, and some of them, as you can see, are really very rare in Ireland. So I'm just going to go through the first, um, the first four or five species of poa. So poa annua is your annual meadow grass, the most common meadow grass that we have in, our, in Ireland and Britain. And it's a small annual grass. So in other words, it's annual, it usually dies back after flowering, um, but it does flower more or less all year round. And it's one of the most common species that's recorded in the new year plant hunt. Um, so it's flowering even in December, January. And so um, very much an all year, all rounder. It likes trampled areas like paths, amenity grassland, um, golf courses, the likes of that. The shoot itself, is or the, the, the flowering head itself is actually quite flattened as well. So as we were discussing this morning, it's almost like it's 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 saying, right, I'm going to be flattened, so I might as well grow flat in the first place as well. So it's um, generally just a just a small little hardy plant that puts up with a lot of a lot of trampling. So there's quite a nice graphic here that shows the various different parts of the plant. You can see um, quite nicely here, I think, the boat shaped tip. Um, it's got that slightly three dimensional um, element to it. It's quite a short leaf as well um, compared to some of the other poas. The other, uh, another characteristic is these papery margins to the lemmas. So it looks almost whitish green at times. And the other characteristic is young leaves of your annual meadow grass can often be kind of have this little wrinkle, this transverse wrinkle, um, particularly when the plant is young. And the ligule is sort of a, I suppose, as we'll see in comparison with some of the other species, it's sort of a medium, medium length, not too short, not too long. Poa trivialis then, rough meadow grass is, um, on the whole, it's quite a triangular plant. So trivialis, think triangular, everything is triangular. The inflorescence itself, the flowering head is actually quite triangular too. So while well, you might say, well, surely all of the poas are, but this just, it, it has sort of almost the, the base, um, branches at the base are kind of more straight across rather than drooping down. So the whole thing has a triangular outline. Uh, the ligule is triangular and pointed, so triangular pointed ligule. The leaf is also triangular, so it tapers gradually towards the tip and it tends to be tufted. So tufted or sometimes shortly stoloniferous. And finally, uh, couldn't think of anything beginning with T to remind me of this, but the leaves are bright green and they tend to be quite glossy on the back. So this is um, from the BSBI handbook of grasses. Um, so there are some nice, um, really nice diagrams there. Um, the, I suppose the main thing here is your triangular ligule, which is very, um, very obvious. And the two florets in the spikelet. And this tufted growth here as well. So Poa trivialis really grows in a wide range of uh, conditions, um, damp or humid conditions. So you'll often find it in wet grassland, but sometimes it's in kind of seed mixes in more improved swards as well. Um, you'll also find it in bare waste ground, and it's often can even be weedy in arable fields and cultivated grassland because it's quite a good colonizer. It even crops up in open woodland and hedgerows and so on as well, where, you, where it 
doesn't particularly care for is very acid, dry or infertile soils. So it likes a bit of bit of fertility, um, maybe more neutral, slightly basic soils and definitely a bit damper. And it's totally happy then. Now the leaf sheath color is, um, it can sometimes be quite strong in Poa trivialis, um, particularly if it's on bare ground. So maybe it's getting a lot of light and it can often have these purple, um, these purple leaf sheets. In these situations as well, the plant is usually quite flat and then maybe grows upwards. So flat initially grows along and then comes upwards. The tufted nature of the plant is very obvious here as well. But the, the purple sheath on its own isn't a great character because there's lots of other plants will have, lots of other grasses will have that characteristic as well. Um, in particular, I myself have uh, certainly a few years ago was there was a bit of confusion with Poa trivialis and Glyceria fluitans because they both have these very flat, um, these quite flattened shoots with the long ligule and that's a characteristic of Glyceria as well and they'll often grow in the same kind of situations too maybe kind of bare mud or you know by the sides of lakes and ponds and you know flooding and so on. But with Glyceria fluitans, what you would have is these tiny little cross walls or cross veins that, that you can actually see. Sometimes you can see them with the naked eye. You can definitely see them with the hand lens. So if you sort of peel back the leaf sheath and have a look and hold it up to the light and see, can you see any of these cross, cross veins or cross walls? If you can, then it's it's certainly not poa and it's more than likely glyceria. So just beware, you can um, find some kind of looky likies um, with poa trivialis in particular. That flattened shoot isn't um, confined just to, just to poa and certainly not just to poa trivialis. So poa pretensis then is the smooth meadow grass and um, this has Quite, again, quite a triangular, triangular head. Um, when it's gone over, it's even more drooping than um, Poa trivialis. So it sort of looks very sad indeed. The head is also a little bit smaller than Poa trivialis. Um, and one of the main characteristics is this short, um, blunt ligule. So it's much wider than it's long. And the other thing also is the parallel sided leaves. You can kind of you can see it on the diagram here. So these leaves are parallel pretty much all the way along until the leaf tip. So poor pretensis, uh, the leaf is parallel sided, so P for parallel, and then it narrows fairly abruptly to the tip. So I've said about folding the leaf over if you want to see, you know, how how parallel sided it is to see if the upper third is the same width as the lower third. The ligule is short. Um, the only way of trying to think of things for P, the ligule is paltry or pathetic. Um, it's very short, doesn't really amount to much. The spikelets, as I say, of the gone overheads, they tend to droop really significantly. Um, and often enough, the heads can look kind of a light color, like strawy, beigey brown. And the color of poor pretensis tends to be blue green rather than bright green, as it would be in poor trivialis. And finally, then it's they tend to be rhizomatous. So the flowering columns are usually in dense tufts at the nodes of the rhizome. So you have it spreads with rhizomes, but at each of the nodes, it can actually be tufted. But you may have to sort of just search around for rhizomes just to see is there any spreading from plant to plant. Poa humilis then is similar to poa pretensis and it has been taxonomically quite um, difficult, if you like, um, to kind of pigeonhole. It has alternated between being a subspecies of poa pretensis and a species in its own right. So in some texts you'll see it being referred to as poa pretensis subspecies irrigata. Um, it was also formerly known as poa subcerulea, so when it was a it was a species and then it wasn't a species and now it's a species again. So Poa humilis um, looks like Poa pretensis, 
So if you're in a, a damp or a coastal habitat and you see something that looks like poa pretensis, well, maybe it is poa pretensis, but you should also consider poa humilis and look for distinguishing characteristics which will help you to determine which of the two it is. So at least be mindful of the fact that it could be one of these two species. So the differences then, um, for poa pretensis, um, you have, these are the glooms um, of the spikelet of poa pretensis. As you can see here, the lower gloom does not have another pair of veins. So it just has the one vein here. And we contrast this with poa humilis. So here we have the lower gloom has an extra pair of veins. So you've got your vein here on the, in the, the middle, if you like, and you've got another two veins on either, one vein on either side of your middle vein. So you have three veins on your lower gloom. The other thing is poor pretensis is usually hairless at, on the sheath and at the kind of junction on, around the ligule, whereas poa humilis tends to have hairs quite often. Now they're not always there, or they might have been there earlier on in the year, but they've got knocked off since. So again, look for the freshest material you can get. Um, so it can be quite hairy. And the other thing is, um, and pff, I mean, this you, you can sometimes see um, that poor pretensis tends to be a little bit more, the, the flowering shoots tend to be more tufted along the rhizome, whereas with poa humilis, they tend to arise more singly or maybe loosely tufted. So just to recap, um, look at the veins on the glooms. So in poor pretensis, your lower gloom usually has only one vein, and that is your central one, whereas in poa humilis, both glooms, both the upper and the lower, have three veins. So your central one and a vein on either side. The other thing is the size of the glooms in poor pretensis. The lower gloom of poor pretensis is slightly smaller. So you should be able to see it here. This is your lower gloom here of poor pretensis. So it is noticeably smaller really than the upper gloom. Whereas in poor humilis, they're both but they're both about the same size. The shape of the glooms, glooms of poa humilis are more sharply pointed than those of poa pretensis. If you haven't been able to see the glooms um, and the keels, or, sorry, and the veins, then the shape might be able to help you out as well. And finally, the hairs um, on the sheath of poa humilis can be um, diagnostic as well. But as they, this can be quite variable and it also can depend on the quality of the material that you're looking at. So poa nemoralis, um, it's as I say, not really a, a it's not a grassland grass as such, um, but it, it is particularly um, more common in, in Britain than in Ireland, woods and shady places. Um, it's quite a delicate grass, uh, sometimes might even be confused um, for an agrostis because it is quite, um, it has that sort of delicate feathery look, probably because it grows in the shade so much. So, you know, it's just not, uh, not as robust as some of the other ones. The leaves are soft um, rather than firm. Um, so they look a bit limp. Um, it's tufted. The leaves um, do have tram lines, but they're visible really only near the apex. And the nodes can be kind of a blackish color as well. So as I say, much more common in Britain than in Ireland. It's not native here. Um, it's been introduced um, post 1500s. And one of the ways it was introduced was it's thought be a cheap wool, you know, fleeces coming over from Britain and elsewhere into Ireland. So that is the end of the poor part of the presentation. Uh, there's there's an interesting question about whether you should be looking at the the ligules on the vegetative shoots or the uh, flowering shoots um, with poas. Um, yeah, well, I, I think it depends on the key, really, doesn't it? Um, so if you're looking at a vegetative key, then it is just asking you 
about the characteristics of the ligule on vegetative shoots. Um, and for example, like there are a few good vegetative keys around and certainly Hubbard has a vegetative key at the back of it. Um, whereas other keys, like we'd say the BSBI handbook, if will specify, will often specify whether you should be looking at vegetative shoots um, or whether you're looking at flowering shoots. I think yeah. the default is flowering shoots, am I right? But it so. will specify then if it's the, the tillers, if it's the vegetative shoots. Yeah. Uh, it will actually say. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So it depends, really, is the answer. Um, depends on your key. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Funila. Uh, thank you everyone for participating and asking lots of lovely questions.